uh, more blur. Uh, and I don't know why why we ever moved away from that. But anyhow, that's uh, that's our talk tonight. It's all the, it's all the Andy um, uh, went to uh, Luther College in Iowa. He has a master's degree from uh, University of Wisconsin. Uh, Green Bay. Uh, he's coordinator for the Wisconsin uh, Bird Conservation <coughs> Initiative and works for the DNR. And without further ado, help me welcome Andy Paulus. Yeah, whenever you're ready. Um, Oop, it's okay. I'll talk very loud. Um, I'm good at two things. Talking and making excuses for my Vikings allegiances. So, um, just while while I'm talking, I'm going to send this around. This is a one of the nest boxes that I actually just pulled out of the woods last weekend. That um, unfortunately became a target for shooting practice probably at some point this fall. But they'll give you a sense for what the boxes look like as I talk about them later. And there is even an old Cathonitary warbler uh, mattress. Call it in the bottom of it. We'll take a look. So, so thanks for having me, everybody. Um, before I start talking about the Golden Swamp Warbler, uh, the military warbler, um, I just want to give a quick a quick overview of uh, um, the Bird Conservation Initiative. My my day job is to coordinate the Wisconsin Bird Conservation Initiative for the Wisconsin DNR. I technically work for the DNR, but I always tell people I work for all of you. So the Olive Leopold chapter, Audubon chapter, is one of over 170 different partners around the state that have endorsed the Bird Conservation Initiative. And WIBC partners, uh, the purpose of WIBC is really to sort of um, connect like-minded bird groups, businesses, agencies, um, bird clubs of all sorts, and really help us do something big collectively that we couldn't do individually as an individual chapter or club. So uh, WIMSI partners are involved in everything from education, um, and you can talk to Susan and Dennis here about flying wild and all sorts of cool um, bird-related education programs to habitat, um, planning and guidance and management to uh, research and monitoring. I don't know if anybody here participates in any, either the night jar survey or the owl survey or the marsh bird survey or a bunch of new surveys that WIBC partners have created in the last five or six years. Um, important bird areas program, the bird city program we helped to sponsor and get off the ground and I'm sure Kent will tell you all about it if, if you want to hear about it. And Kent and I are both wearing our shirts today. We're, and, uh, <laughs> mine are being hidden, unfortunately. So, um, so the WIPC partners are doing a lot statewide, and you can kind of catch up with it at uh, www.wisconsinbirds.org. There's a Yahoo group you can sign up for to get um, sort of weekly updates on what's going on in the world of birds in Wisconsin and the region. And WIPC has a Facebook page and some other ways to keep involved. So. Uh, and so what I'll say is I'm going to give you a, a spiel on Golden Swamp Warblers, but afterwards, after you've exhausted me with questions about <laughs> one of the coolest birds ever, uh, feel free to ask me questions about what's going on around the state with birds. Um, I get paid to talk a lot, so don't hesitate to take me up on it. So with that, um, the theme, the theme music for tonight, if there was theme music for a talk, is the sort of the Gilligan's Island um, intro. And keep that, keep that in mind, because really this project started um, in October, a dark and stormy afternoon, no, uh, in October of 2007, I believe, when my colleague Mike Foy, who's a wildlife biologist um, in Rock and Green County, convinced a few of us to come down and take a look at the Lower Sugar River because it's a, a really neat ecosystem. And uh, he was ramping up some restoration efforts down there and wanted to get some of us with statewide expertise excited about it. And uh, as I happened to do, I made the ultimate mistake of saying to Mike, who I didn't know super well at the time, 
I said to Mike, wow, this looks like really good for planetary warbler habitat, Mike. Have you ever thought about doing a nest box trail down here? And as you'll see, uh, the next thing I knew, he had, he had helped build 300 plus nest boxes <laughs> and away we were. So with that, um, uh, you know, the, the world of the prothonotary warbler, you can kind of see in the background, it's these sort of swampy, wet forests. We call them floodplain forests or bottomland hardwoods. These are really, really important habitats, both in Wisconsin and, and all throughout the central and southeastern U.S. And, you know, they're, they're unbelievably biodiverse places, but they're often, um, especially in areas heavily influenced by agriculture, like Rock County, where the Sugar River is, often the sort of the last corridors of undeveloped or unaltered habitat left. So they're really important corridors for biodiversity. In Wisconsin, they have a bunch of rare tree and plant species, things at the northern edge of the range. The Sugar River has the only naturally occurring sycamore trees in Wisconsin. And, um, you know, lots of diverse wetland fauna. And, you know, if you think about the lower Wisconsin Riverway, um, the lower chip, um, the lower sugar, the lower rock, some of the most extensive uh, forests outside of the North Woods left. And the prothonotary warbler is, is really interesting for a, no, a number of reasons. Um, in the eastern U.S., it's our only cavity nesting warbler. I always ask the trivia question, does anybody know the other cavity nesting warbler in the United States? Hint, it doesn't live in Wisconsin. to this place, you might see it. <laughs> and if you're a fan of the Peanuts uh, comic strip, you might be a fan of its name. So. Lucy is horrible. Yep. So, uh, you'll have to do better on my next question. <laughs> uh, so the planetary warbler in Wisconsin is sort of at the northern edge of the range. And they're a real specialist on these floodplain forests. And it, for those of you that participated in the last Breeding Bird Atlas, you can see that prothonotaries kind of map these riparian forests really well. You can see the upper Miss, which probably has the most birds in Wisconsin, all the way up into the lower St. Croix. You can see the Bark River here. This is the rock or the lower sugar where, where my talk is about, the lower Wisconsin, and then the lower Wolf. They're all good places for and, and right now, prothonotary warblers are basking in the warm suns of the Caribbean. Um, and they sort of winter from, in the Caribbean and then also sort of Nicaragua all the way down to northern South America, so Colombia, Venezuela. So uh, like a lot, like most of our other birds, they, they, they really only live in Wisconsin for a few months every year. I like to tell people that we're really borrowing planetary warblers from the folks that live in Costa Rica, right? Um, and, and I should say in, in the, well, so for planetary warblers, besides being just really cool looking, um, they're a species of greatest conservation need in Wisconsin. Um, we wrote a wildlife, the state completed a wildlife action plan in 2005 and as part of that, the, um, the federal government had us sort of identify which species are of greatest conservation need, and this was one of them. And, th and that's because they have small population sizes here. They've declined across their range because of forest conversion to agriculture and other uses. Um, they're really sensitive, as I'll show in a minute, about sort of hydrological modification of these forests. So. Um, they're good sort of indicators for healthy bottom and hardwoods. Um, and like a lot of birds um, in the eastern U.S., they're now kind of common hosts for brown-headed cowbirds. Um, and in the winter, what we're, what we're starting to learn more about is a lot of these species that we focus so much on their breeding habitat, they're really actually um, very influenced by their, their wintering habitat as well, because that's where they're actually spending the majority of their life. So in the winter, um, Prothonotaries are spending, are pretty tied to these coastal mangrove forests and the associated wet upland forests. And if you know anything about mangrove forests, um, you know, the world has lost well over half of its mangrove forests, which is a 
a big issue. Um, so, I'm not going to depress you the entire night. I promise. <laughs> so, for all these reasons, it's a really good sort of focal species. You can do things well for this species. You can do thing. You can do things for a lot of species. So, um, in just sort of an illustration of this, Jeff Hoover, who's uh, at the uh, Illinois Natural History Survey has been doing a, a phenomenal amount of work, demographic work on the monetaries in those, those little milk, milk cartons that you saw on that previous slide. And what, what he was looking at was um, doing wetland restorations in these floodplain forests. And, and in southern Illinois what's happened is um, as you uh, start to channel water a little bit, as you pull water faster <coughs> off the fields and into these forests, it tends to blow out um, gullies in these forests. And when you blow gullies, it's like pulling the, um, pulling the drain plug on your bath, bathtub. It, it, it reduces the forest's ability to hold water and just slowly let it infiltrate the groundwater. So you get these gullies and it tends to drain the forest and dry it out. So they're actually going in and plugging gullies. And they're looking and then they're kind of monitoring both the hydrology. So what happened was they got a lot more water in the forest, which is good. They got deeper water. And they got a really strong burn response. So after they did these wetland restorations, they got higher numbers of prothonotaries, yellow-throated warblers, wood ducks, yellow-crowned night herons, which don't you wish we had higher numbers of yellow-crowned night herons and hooded mergansers. So really good densities, but, but also you can see that by restoring these wetlands, not only did you get more prothonotaries, but you got a lot more reproductive output. And so that makes them a really good sort of indicator species for forest health. So when, <coughs> after Mike took my challenge to heart, and after we had somehow navigated a 16-foot boat down the Lower Shark River, which as you'll see in a second, is no easy feat. Um, we put our head together and decided, well, maybe we should see if we can get a nest box program to work here for prothonotaries and start to think more about using prothonotaries here as a species um, to focus work on. So, so first off, we wanted to do some basic stuff like, can we even get them to use the boxes? You know, um, I think at least in the in the waterfowl world. <coughs> The general thinking now is if you talk to the duck biologists, well, you know, at one time wood duck boxes were really important for wood duck recovery, but now the woods are a lot older in these floodplain forest systems. There's a lot of cavities. You probably probably don't need wood duck boxes out there. And, and uh, my colleague, who shall remain nameless that I work with every day, said pretty much the same thing to me about prothonotaries. Um, the other thing we want to look at is would the box increase productivity? So a lot of these floodplain forests are just ribbons of forest now in kind of an agricultural matrix, which, which is a good recipe for really high raccoon predation and really high rates of cowbird parasitism. So Mike, as you'll see in a minute, designed a super box, which is impenetrable to all raccoons and cowbirds. And then, you know, would that re result in more prothonotaries in the system? And then what, what I was actually most interested in is would, would prothonotaries translate to ecosystem conservation? So if we can get people really interested in prothonotaries, would it get people really interested in floodplain forests? Which is no easy feat, because if you've ever been in a floodplain forest in June, you'll notice um, an abundance of insect life, mostly insects that consume your blood um, an abundance of poison ivy, stinging nettles, uh, and, and other pleasant things that keeps you from enjoying a floodplain forest. So, I was really inspired by the bluebird folks. If if um, if you if you know what happened with bluebirds in Wisconsin in the in the 80s, the Bluebird Restoration Association of Wisconsin got started, and you can actually go. And now, Kent, every year we fledge thousands upon thousands of bluebirds out of bluebird boxes, right? You bet. And you can actually go into the Federal Breeding Bird Survey data and you can see the bluebird trend for Wisconsin go like this. 1984, 85. Right. And it actually starts going like that. So it's pretty clear that the box program made a big difference for them. So, and not only that, but you've now got a whole cadre 
a bluebird, uh, we'll call them bluebird people. <laughs> I don't know if there's a better term. Bluebird <laughs> fanatics <laughs> is light, lightly put, probably. There's these strange people that go out and monitor bluebird nests all year long, probably. But anyway, and that's really, I think Kent and others would tell you that it really changes the way you, once you get involved in a nest box program, you sort of change the way you think about habitats and the environment. So I wanted to see if, if that would work. <coughs> so as I said, in 2009, I was probably minding my own business, looking at my email, and Mike Foy invited me to a box building party. And the next thing I knew, I showed up, and there was like 10 DNR staff people there. It was a beautiful March day or something. And uh, they cranked out 300 boxes, which are really these PVC boxes, as you saw, in a little over a day, which is pretty amazing. And what's even more interesting is Mike um, figured out how to do it for about seven to ten dollars per box, which is, you know, very reasonable. If you go to a store and try and buy a bluebird box, you probably pay 30 or 40 bucks. Of course, you could build them cheaper yourself. So uh, we, we went big or we went home, we went big with uh, boxes. And Mike did a lot of research, and you saw um, it sits it sits easily on a, on a piece of conduit. It's got a little set screw. It's really easy to take on and off to monitor. The top twists off. He's got that top was broken, but you, you saw the insulation that's normally glued to the top. Top. Mike really wanted to make like the Hilton of boxes for the monitors. The he researched the nest hole diameter, and um, I think it's an inch, inch and a quarter. Um, anyway, he made it such that cowbirds really can't get in, as you'll hear about later. And really a lot, a lot of the other cavity nesters have trouble getting in there too. So really the only species we've had in the boxes so far are house wrens and prothonotheries um, and a, just a couple of tree swallows. But um, it's got drainage on the bottom. So it's just, it's a really good design. In fact, good luck with it so far. And that first year I, I suckered a few volunteers into coming out with me in April and we got in canoes and we started canoeing down the river and we tried to be real scientific by not putting them too close together and, and GPSing them all because I was worried that I'd never find these things again. And, and this, this poor girl, I think her name was Katie, the day before we were going, she, her mom emailed Mike Foy asking if Katie, her daughter, was thinking about getting into the field, if there's any volunteer opportunities. And uh, <laughs> little did she know, we threw her into her canoe and I gave her my wife's chest waders and, and off we went and, and she suffered through a day with me and Alan Crossley in a canoe. But uh, So we were just kind of flying by the seat of our pants this first year. We just kind of wanted to put a bunch of boxes out, um, try and figure out what our search image was and I had heard Kent and others, Pat Reddy, talk to me about bluebirds. Kind of used the first year to let the birds tell us what was going on out there. And it was really interesting, um, in this picture, I think you can see it, but so here's the box right here. Um, and we put this out and I took a picture of Katie and Alan and oh, this is great. And I put the camera down and I looked up and I don't know if you can see this silver maple snag, but there's like seven perfectly sized downy woodpecker holes right on this snag. <laughs> and I thought to myself after I put it up, there is no way this is gonna work. I mean, there are cavities everywhere. So, so that summer we got out there two or three times. Um, you can see, Mike always makes fun of me after this picture. This is wildlife biologist Mike, no waders, you know. <laughs> he did his master's thesis in the coastal plain of Texas, so this is nothing. And here's Andy with my chest waders, my bug out. There's literally no piece of skin showing because I can't stand mosquitoes. So, um, so anyway, we really wanted to get out there a couple of times that first summer to check the boxes and, re and get a sense for what was going on. And, you know, we did the typical types of monitoring. We checked out the nest contents and Mike had a couple of dental mirrors. You can see him using it there that extend that you could put over the top of the box and all that kind of stuff. And, and we put boxes out in Avon. I forgot to say we put them out at two other places as well um, in Rock and Jefferson County. And, and here's kind of what we found. Uh, 
you know, going in, we were worried that none of the boxes would get used. So I remember that first summer in 09 when we we got when we opened the first box that actually had a prothonotin in it. He and I did this little dance and jumped around in the marsh. But you can see we had three areas: the Albany Wildlife Area, Avon Bottoms, which is on the lower sugar, and then. We had some boxes, 15 boxes on the on the Rock River by Lake that dumps into Lake Koshkin on the Blackhawk Island area. And um, overall, across all three study areas, 85% of all the boxes we put out there got used by something. And that just blew me away because you walk through this habitat and there are snags everywhere. It's not really young forest, it's not old growth forest either, but there are amazing amounts of woodpeckers in this habitat of four or five species, but it's obvious that there's an intense amount of competition for available nest cavities. Either that or this box literally is the greatest thing that they've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they really want to nest it. So you can see overall almost 40% of our boxes in the first year were used by prothonotaries, and that just blew us away. And yet it really depended where you were in Albany, we had one dummy nest there. And, you know, in hindsight, it's a real fragmented forest. There probably aren't many prothonotaries there. But you can see every single one of our boxes, 19 boxes, had a house right in it. <laughs> and when you talk to other prothonotary biologists from further south, southern Illinois, Indiana, Tennessee, none of them have house wrens in their ecosystem. House wrens, I didn't actually even know this before I started this project. House wrens are really... And they have a northern distribution, and then a, you know, there's house wrens all through Central and South America. So they don't really deal too much with house wrens. Like Jeff Hoover's project area, they don't deal too much with house wrens. <laughs> Here you can see that these two species are quite competitive with one another. And you can see it was a lot better in the other two study areas. But, you know, so we felt really good after the first year. Um, we had no evidence of nest parasitism, so Mike's design seemed to really work well for keeping cowbirds out. And, and you know, you compare that to Dave Flaspoler's work on the lower Wisconsin River, and they had almost a third of their nests parasitized. Um, he did. He put some nest boxes out in 1994 and didn't have any of them used. And as I said before, we had really high rates. And one thing that was really interesting, and this is where it's really fun to get out and monitor birds, because you start to get involved in their day-to-day -day life. When we did our first nest box check, I want to say the first week of June, we had a lot of boxes that were empty. Neither species, nothing. And then I showed you that graph. By the end of the year, they were almost all used. We had a lot of nests initiated after early June. And we really wondered about that. Are those <coughs> new birds just arriving into the system? Or are those double broods? Are those the second broods that are getting started? And then, of course, we were blown away by the house wren competition. And I didn't mention this, but we really tried to put the boxes out in the water, in the shade. Thonotaries um, like to be over standing water that's like two feet or more deep. And Jeff Hoover really thinks that has to do with those cavities are safer from raccoons. Raccoons like to get their feet wet, but if they get their belly wet, they, they sort of give up on a predation event. So we were we thought we wouldn't get many wrens because of where we put these boxes out over the water, but the wrens are very cagey. And uh, very, as all bluebird folks, I can see Kent already shaking about wrens over there. So I was a little surprised. There are lots of chickadees and titmice in this system. We didn't have any chickadee or titmice nests. <laughs> I don't know if maybe they're really worried that their chicks, when they fledge, just can't make it over the water. I'm not sure. So, and lots of little natural history things. When you, the first time you you check a nest box, um, it's a little bit of a life changing experience when there's actually a prothonotary in there because the female prothonotaries, which are almost as pretty as the males, they don't. They sit tight until you screw the top off. And she'll come fluttering out the box, and they have white on the outer tail feathers. And they'll spread their tail out, and they just kind of flutter out like this, and they just tap the water away from you like a killdeer, trying to get you to follow them. Mm. And it's almost like a butterfly <coughs> emerging out of this nest box. It's, it's, I've been trying to get it on video for th three years now, and I can't do it justice. So it was just, you know, really amazing. We had one 
one nest box Mike opened up. We didn't think there was a bird in there because the first time we checked it, it was empty. And he was surprised that there was a warbler in there. And she fluttered out, and a bullfrog jumped up and just, there's bullfrogs there, and just went, <laughs> and missed her by like this much. So there is a little bit of a risk to, like you can see chicks fledging or something. There are things that will eat them, but. Anyway, so we went into the war room, you know, in January, trying to figure out what we should do next in 2010. And we had some theories that the wrens liked the boxes that were near uh, perches, stick, sticky areas, as Mike liked to call them. So we tried to move the boxes to be a little bit less wren friendly. Um, I scheduled a Natural Resources Foundation trip in May to actually check on this in May as the birds were arriving. I wanted to see how that kind of process was happening. Mike, um, who just has too much time on his hands, I think, thought, well, those boxes that they didn't use, maybe if we put a planetary decoy on top of the box, that the male is going to really come in and try to get that box. So he made these little wire yellow flags and put little eye spots on them and stuff. Anyway, uh, I don't even need to say more about that. But um, And then I actually sought out a, a limited number of volunteers to try this out on their own. And, it, and so our, our, our predictions in 2010 that we our occupancy would increase and, you know, uh, birds that were successful in 2009, if you look at the literature, they're more likely to come back to that same nest site or that same box site. So we thought just by chance that's going to happen. But also we thought our, our placement would, would make it work a little bit better because you learn something every year about where they want to be and where they don't want to be. And we thought wrens would go down and, and we started um, changing our mind about spacing the boxes out at least 100 meters so that there wouldn't be too many boxes in one territory because what we found out was um, the males actually put dummy nests in all the boxes in his territory and it's actually uh, sexier to the female if he's got more than one choice and some of those boxes that were active in June here the box 70 meters away was active in July so we either thought he was courting two different females or double brood so we actually put some more boxes in some of the best areas. And, you know, part of me was just wondering, man, if you just kept sticking boxes out here, would you just keep getting more and more and more birds? It's just crazy how many, how many, um, how many birds we had in the system. Going to this project, I thought, if you look at the important bird area, this area is an important bird area. Randy Hoffman nominated it, and he estimated, I think somewhere between 20 and 50 pairs of Monetaries might be in this whole system. And that, that first year, I think we had 20 plus nests just in the boxes that we put out. So there's way more prothonotaries here than we thought. Um, so, <coughs> on to the results. So we put somewhere between 65 and 70 boxes in the Avon bottoms. And I, I don't have an exact number. You'll see why in a minute. We did have a bit of an incident in June where, um, well, if you find a GPS unit somewhere in Illinois, <laughs> and a large roll of steel conduit, let me know because I lost it somewhere. But uh, one thing that was, if you remember back to 2010, it was a really early spring. All the oaks were done flowering before May even got here. It was like the worst warbler watching ever. And um, we had uh, some, we went out the first week of May and were putting boxes out and a lot of the birds were already there. We had um, nest initiation for early nests, you know, right at the end of that first week of May, which is about a week and a half, two weeks earlier than what was found in the breeding bird atlas. All told, in those wow. 65 to 70 boxes, we had almost 40 active nests, which going into the project, we didn't even know if there were 40 birds in this, this whole system. Our average clutch size was almost five chicks per nest, which is a lot higher than the atlas. And we confirmed our first double brood in Wisconsin. 
So conservatively in 2010, we figured just out of our boxes, not counting natural nests in the system, there might have, we might have fledged as many as 200 chicks just out of our boxes. So we were, we were just blown away by that. And some of our predictions definitely came true. I should have probably flipped these, but you can see the relationship, the, the magenta bar is the warbler and the, the tan beige bar is the wren. In 2009, we had more wrens than warblers, and that really strongly flipped in 2010. So why was that? We probably put the boxes in a little bit better places because we learned something. Um, and we let the birds kind of tell us what was going on out there. Birds from last year, we didn't ban any of these birds, so I'm just guessing, but they probably returned to the same boxes, and I've got a little bit of anecdotal proof about that in a second. And then 2010 was also a very wet year. In fact, on that NRF field trip, you could basically canoe anywhere you wanted through the entire system. Um, and wet years are good for pathonotaries, as we'll see. So, just some highlights. Um, we had really high water all the way through into July of 2010, which, as I say here, led to more exciting canoe and boat travel. Um, it's actually easier to get through this system because of all the deadfalls when the water is really high. Um, our, our Natural Resources Foundation trip was a huge success. Um, just a quick story, we, we, we showed up at the boat landing that morning and the water was over its banks. It was obviously above or at flood stage. And Mike, who's a very prudent, cautious biologist, said, well, Andy, I don't think we should do this. It's too dangerous. And so, you know, we sort of announced that to the 20 people who had showed up that morning at 8 o'clock or 7.30. We kind of got these blank stares. <laughs> and I sort of gave it a few seconds and I said, so if Mike and I leave, are you guys all going to go canoeing down this river anyway? And they all sort of said yes. <laughs> and it was at that point I realized I had recruited a bunch of canoers to my field trip, and they weren't really birders. So, so I took them down anyway. And as I say here, it was probably the fastest trip I've ever gone down that river. But it was great. We canoed right up to boxes. There were females packing these boxes full of moss as we were standing or sitting and a canoe 15 feet away from the, from the boxes. It was, it was really fan, fantastic. And we got up close and personal with some, some good birds. <laughs> um, I swear to you, before 2010, I've canoed all my life. I've been to the Boundary Waters a million times. I've never swamped a canoe. And I dumped my canoe three times that year. Twice was my fault. Once I'm gonna claim it was somebody else's fault. But just adds, it adds to the excitement. <laughs> I don't really need to explain that. And you know, one early lesson I learned in 2010 was weight distribution in your canoe. You really don't want to tape steel conduit to the one go. <laughs> and Mike has since bought me a lanyard for my new GPS. <laughs> What I said to people is everybody likes to scavenger hunt. And when I lost my GPS, I lost all of my locations for these boxes. But it was really fun because I got to go out and search for them all again. And in doing so, I found some really cool places that I hadn't seen the first time. And, uh, and even this year, I just randomly found some boxes. And it was like you know finding candy or something. And you're <laughs> finding a $20 bill in your pants pocket. So, uh, a great year in 2010. We were overjoyed with our results. So, in, in that year, um, uh, the DNR outreach staff helped us to write an article <coughs> for the Natural Resources magazine, which, if you saw it, um, um, was very popular. Um, in all the outreach things I've done for DNR, I've never got as much feedback as I did for that article. In fact, still to this day, it's on the web. Just yesterday, a guy called me from southern Indiana wanting all the box designs, and he had gotten his local biologists all excited about doing a planetary box pro project there. And so I, I still get calls to this day about it. Beautiful cover of the magazine. And it was, yeah, it's a, it's a golden swamp warbler, so it's, it sells magazines, right? <laughs> so, um, so we started broadening our approach, and I recruited a bunch more volunteers, and 
I had folks um, building boxes and placing boxes everywhere from right in downtown Madison to um, various places across South Central and Eastern Wisconsin. And probably places that I don't even know about because they just built them and they didn't tell me where they were. So um, I was horribly busy this summer and didn't monitor the boxes as well as I did the year before. So probably lost a little bit of data, but we had a couple of good days of monitoring. And um, the big difference in 2011 was it was a much drier year. It was a colder spring, if you remember. Um, some cold, dreary days in May, which made for unbelievable warbler watching this year, because the tree phenology was a lot slower this year, but um, probably reduced um, nest site occupancy and productivity. And um, I didn't get out there in May, so I'm not 100% sure. But. And then starting in about June 20th or so, at least in the Madison area, the, the spigots were turned off, and we didn't really get rain for the rest it was very dry and so when we checked boxes um, in July and then in September um, almost all of our boxes were dry underneath them if they weren't in the main channels or the biggest oxbow hunt. So um, definitely a change in results. Um, the cool, one of the cool things was some of our volunteers had really good success. These are pictures from Tom Schaefer who put out um, boxes on the Rock River by um, Eustace bird, I think. And uh, one day while monitoring, he got these great pictures of a pair coming in. And he's got this great picture of a female cowbird looking into the box, but <laughs> he watched her for five minutes. She couldn't get into the into the hole. So that was really, that was, you know, I would have paid him a lot of money for that, but he gave it to me for free. But, uh, um, and they fledged, I think, five or six young. So that was great. And what's amazing about that is if you look at an aerial photo of where he put that box, it's just this tiny little patch of wet forest on the Rock, Rock River. It doesn't look awesome, but it has some potential, right? Um, a lot of volunteers learned something about box placement and you know where the warblers wanted to be. Uh, the picnic point boxes right in the university property in downtown Madison, if you're in the picnic point, uh, fledged, I think, four or five young, so they were super excited about that. And, you know, a hundred gajillion people got to watch those because there were a hundred gajillion people walk every day. Uh, we had lower prothonotary usage in the Sugar River, as I'll show you in a second, and our clutch size was a lot lower this year than the previous year. So, you can see we, we fledged, yeah, maybe around 60, 70 chicks. Um, it's probably a little bit of an underestimate because as I said before, I'm still discovering boxes uh, that I may have lost at one point. So here are the results. And these are sort of 09, 2010, 2011. We're still getting really high rates of use. Almost all the boxes are claimed by somebody. But in 2011, only a little bit under 60% of the boxes were used by prothonotaries as compared to almost 80% in 2010. And a little bit higher renew, so I think the drier weather um, made a big difference. A um, couple of cool things from this year, uh, as I've mentioned now seven or eight times, I did lose some boxes because of the GPS unit, and so I didn't clean them out last year. And we always assumed that you had to clean out wren nests. Wrens just basically jammed the box full of sticks, right? You've all seen that with bluebirds. This year, we actually discovered that female prothonotaries will build right into old wren nests. So we had, it was really interesting, we'd go up to a box and it'd be, you know, sticks coming out of it, we'd just think wren. We'd open it up and out would come this beautiful warbler. And so that was really exciting for us. But then at one, then we started to realize, wow, this is gonna make monitoring really difficult because if you don't clean that box out from year to year, it's pretty hard to tell what was in it that year since the she won't put a lot of moss in it on top of the wren nest. She just basically builds her little grassy cup. So that made me realize you really to do good monitoring, you got to clean them out every year to sort of re push the reset button on them. So just a few stories, and then we'll I'll take some questions. But just to kind of highlight. 
Um, you know, I think the fun of this, here's a box, this is a classic example of I put a box up and then I looked above the box and there's tons of really beautiful natural cavities. But this was an occupied territory box from 09. And Mike and I didn't get all the boxes. We, we pulled all the boxes the first year because we were worried about ice flow and damage. And it turns out we didn't have to worry about it because we forgot some of them from 2009 and they looked just fine in 2010. So we left them out now. But anyway, first week of May, really early spring, birds were already back. I stuck this box in the water, stuck the conduit in. There's a male singing, you know, right on the other side of the pond the whole time. And we just backed off about 20 feet, like this, and I said, Mike, let's just stand here for a second. And literally within 20 seconds, he flew out of the tree he was singing in, landed right on top of that box, started singing, went inside of it, went out, immediately started getting moss, <coughs> and putting moss to build this sort of dumbiness. 20 seconds. I'm not kidding you. That happened three other times that day including one time a pair that was already there. The female, we're literally in the canoe, we just back paddled like four back paddles. She flew right into the hole and started jamming it full of moss. So they can not only remember, you know, here's a bird that travels all the way from Costa Rica to Wisconsin and back, finds their exact wintering territory in Costa Rica goes back to Wisconsin and can land themselves in the specific box that you put up from the year before. This is a bird that weighs a few grams that you know you can sort of bounce in your hand. It's just pretty incredible when you think about it. And that's that's why I said earlier, I'm pretty sure that boxes that were occupied last year by a pair are reoccupied the next year. It's hard for me to imagine that if they didn't nest in that box last year that they wouldn't have immediately just blown into the hole and started jamming full of moss. So, so we had some greet, greeters that year, and it was such an early spring, I was sort of imagining the birds just sort of hanging around like, when are these guys showing up? Come on, we've been here for like four or five days already. These eggs are heavy. I'm going to start dumping them in a natural cavity. So this particular box on May 14th had four eggs. On, so if you backdate that, they lay one egg a day, right? So if you backdate that, she started the nest on May 10th. They incubate for about two weeks, so she probably hatched those eggs about May 23rd to the 25th. Keep in mind in the atlas, hardly any nests were found even started before May 23rd and 25th. She actually laid six eggs, because on June 3rd, it had six older chicks. And you think about like, I don't know if anyone does a federal breeding bird survey or the Nicolay bird survey or you know any sort of bird monitoring. You always think, you know, that starts June 1st all the way to June 30th, maybe July 4th. Well, by June 3rd, which is the start of the BBS, she was almost done with her first nest. That's how early last year was. And if you assume they fledge after about 10 or 11 days, they probably fledged the first week of June. So that just incredibly early, something we really didn't understand about these birds. Really about two weeks ahead of the results found in the atlas. And we talked to the plant people, um, and I guess I'm sort of calling them all the plant people, but we talked to the plant folk. Um, 2010, they'd say the plant life was about two weeks accelerated as well. So. Here's another box. Uh, I think I was wandering through the woods looking for boxes I may have lost. And I found this great little spot. So on June 3rd, I had some extra boxes with, with me. I just stuck a box up there. And on July 2nd, when I went back to check, it had four chicks in it that were within two to three days of fledging. So that means if you sort of calculate backwards, a pair of prothonotaries had to have started nesting almost the day that I put that box in the water. And that's, you know, two, three weeks into the nesting season. So there's birds just floating around out there, really sort of desperate for good, good spots in this system. Here's another one. Um, it was, we checked it in May. It was empty. On June 3rd, it had eight eggs. 
but it was really weird. There were no females around. The male wasn't really singing near the box. Now, the nearest I can tell is there were females egg dumping in there, which wood ducks and mergansers and other things do. A month later, um, just before I dumped my canoe for the third time, I checked it on July 2nd, and it had four chicks that were two to four days old. So, you know, shortly after that June 3rd chick, a female went in there, removed four of the eight eggs, or removed them all and started relaying her own. So it just sort of, you know, there was some drama going on with this. this <laughs> and a quick cowbird story. Um, Jeff Hoover, who I mentioned a few times, has a, has a cool paper out there about how um, cowbirds are sort of training prothonotaries and, and other birds to be acceptors, to be cowbird egg acceptors. And it's sort of like a mafia scheme where, um, you know, they, they'll come in and remove one warbler egg and, and, and put a cowbird egg in there. And if the birds accept it, they kind of leave it alone. If the birds kick it out or if they start to rebuild, the cowbirds will go in there and just destroy all the warbler eggs, you know. So it's sort of the, the protection racket. For an example. Um, so this particular planetary pair that was in box number 268, in the middle of May they had two eggs. In June, a month later, there were three eggs. Nothing, something didn't look right. No, nobody was around. The eggs weren't warm or anything. The female wasn't on them. Mike and I were kind of confused what was going on. And in, in July, we pulled the nest apart because it was obviously abandoned. And here there was a dead female cowbird in the box, incorporated into the nest material. And so the only thing we could figure is, you know, it got in there and it couldn't get back out again and it died in there. And the prothonotaries were so, like, pissed, they were just like, ah, <laughs> take some of this, you know, we're just going to build a nest right on top of your dead carcass. <laughs> so, you know, payback is, uh, so, and then this, you know, this year, as I was saying, Tom Schaefer got a pair to be successful on that Rock River. And you saw that picture of the, the female cobra that couldn't get in. Um, and, and, you know, he just had a great time monitoring the boxes. It was great to see others besides myself geek out about um, prothonotaries. And this is a photo of the prothonotaries on Picnic Point from Pat Reddy. Um, and they had four eggs by June 1st, so, you know, probably a mid-May, May 20th initiation. And they had at least two or three fledglings that Mike McDowell and, and, and two of his friends uh, saw. And great, a great, uh, a great quote from Mike, um, you know, when they were out there on June 12th, the male, and this is not uncommon for pathologists, they're very visible birds and they're not really afraid of people. The male came right, right up to Mike and his friends and perched a foot from the observer's face and looked right in her face and, and you know, she, it was sort of this very emotional experience for her. So, great birds. So, did the project work? Um, will they use the boxes? Yes, they'll definitely use the boxes. And it looks like our box design was very productive in 2010 when you're averaging almost five chicks a box. That's unheard of rates of productivity. Um, and unfortunately, I didn't, you know, I don't have enough time or money to, to really analyze whether or not it results in a population increase, but um, Jeff Hoover's got a lot of good information on prothonotaries and the, the chicks, a lot of bird, birds, when their chicks fledge, they disperse, they'll set up nesting territories in like other states, you know, they'll disperse very widely. Prothonotaries tend to come back to their natal area, so after talking with Jeff, he thought more than likely if I'm fledging like 200 chicks in a year that we're really going to ramp up numbers in the system. So the other half of this was, you know, can volunteers monitor these trails and and will it lead to bigger and better things? And, and you know, as I mentioned before, these places, there's a reason these places haven't been adopted as the, as the friendly... Uh, places that they really aren't. So this is what you have to canoe through, or go as we tried to do a few times. This is the most common understory plant. <laughs> and not only that, there are 
Prothonotary, or prothonotary. Poison ivy vines in that woods that, uh, that you could probably make into pulp. They're like six inch DBH. They look like an actual tree going up the side of the mountain. Gigantic. Oh my goodness. And um, as you'll notice by my really, my really interesting costume there, um, there are a lot of mosquitoes. I will say when you're on the river channel, the mosquitoes aren't bad. It's when you walk through the oxbow ponds that they are alerted to your presence. <laughs> So, you know, on the positive side, the boxes are really cheap. The de design is really easy for anybody to make. We've got a lot of feedback from magazine readers that have made boxes and had really good success. The monitoring itself, I thought, was not only just easy, but really fun. Um, you don't have to climb trees or anything like that to put them up in the tree. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of challenges, but some of these... I've learned there are folks out there that like a challenge and that like to be in these sort of rivers and trails. But I, I'm really most interested in this. You know, I think the bluebird folk would tell you that after running a bluebird trail for a few years, you start to think like a bluebird. <laughs> and that's kind of what I found was happening to myself. I've, I've been a, um, a self-proclaimed bird nerd since I was probably 10 years old, but after doing this just for one year, it really changed my perspective. And the, the, the sort of litmus test is when you're driving down the road and you, and you drive past this sort of habitat, you know, I, I was born and raised a pretty avid duck hunter. That's kind of how I got into birding. I might have said, oh, that looks like good wood duck habitat, you know, five years ago. <laughs> now when I drive down the interstate and I cross the lower Wisconsin River, all I can see is, oh, could put a box right there, and that would be the best place. You know, you really start to think like a warbler. So you can see in this picture the female prothonotary warbler. They love to hang out on those tip-ups, um, and they'll go right down to the water's edge, and they eat the little water striders and other bugs. You really, you know, if I saw this picture five years ago, I might say, oh, it looks kind of like a swampy forest. Now when I see it, I say, oh, man, there's definitely some potential here for a prothonotary warbler pair. And that, I realized that sort of snuck up on me. I realized that it sort of the experience had changed me and how I looked at the world. And that's if it can work for the most hardened birder like myself, it can probably work for other volunteers as well. So our next steps is we're still, you know, yearly. I do this sort of kind of on the side. So yearly, I keep recruiting a small number of hardy volunteers to adopt segments of floodplain forest where they live or where they recreate. And I still have a supply, um, believe it or not, of boxes. And I usually, if, if somebody's interested and they're not into the actual building of the boxes, which some people are, I'll donate the first five and get you started, including poles, and as much advice as you'll accept <laughs> for free. And you know, on the professional side, we have a committee that um, Georgie Steele, with the DNR coordinates, who's working with a lot of partners right now to sort of um, take some of what we learned, not only from planetary warblers, but other bird surveys that Mike Mossman and others are doing, and really trying to create a larger strategic plan for southern forests. You know, how many do we need to meet different bird population and habitat goals? And planetaries um, may be one of those focal species that we use to really sort of target conservation efforts. So with that, I stole, I don't take pictures. I gave up a long time ago. So I stole all these pictures from these folks and, and, and slides from, from Jeff. But with that, I think that I'll take any questions you might have. Yeah? What, uh, what is your success in having these boxes in moving water um, good. <laughs> good <answer. laughs> the, the, the simple answer is either, either can work. Um, and the first year I was really hyper paranoid about getting boxes out before the birds got there. So that when they got there, you know, they'd see the box before getting suckered into one of these natural cavities or something. Or moving north or something. And then as I sort of illustrated, 
you know, I put plenty of boxes out in May and June after plenty of birds were there and they, they move in. So what I've been telling volunteers who start is, um, you know, you're welcome to go out and put a box where you think, put a box out that looks good in April before the bird gets there. But what works better is to go out there in May, listen for male prothonotary. They're very vocal and very observable. And just walk in on him and just stick a box. You just can watch him. He'll have these little spots. It's almost always near a um, little oxbow pond or something in the woods. And just stick a box right in the middle of his territory. And you can probably stand there for five minutes and he'll probably check that box out while you're standing there. And come right in and tell you to get away because he's busy or something like that. So, and I've had boxes right on the edge of the sugar, which is very fast moving current that get used. I've had them on side channels that have some current get used, and I've had them on dead standing, still stagnant water that get used. So it, it probably doesn't totally matter. I think you want to look for places that are going to hold water through June. So the, the places that end up being muddy in early June tend not to be as good. So. And we prefer north. How do you stick these in? Just literally push down into the mud? Yep. That's why Mike's here. He's stronger than me. But, uh, yeah. How yeah. about us? Are we too far north? Because we own 40 acres that look just like that. And I think we're too far north. I learned this lesson every year. Uh, never say never, because I've been proven <laughs> wrong way too many times. So, I, you know, if I look at aerial photos of the Wisconsin River flowages around Stevens Point, and you know, so you can see these forests that, from the aerial photo, look like. If this was in Rock County, I'd be like, "Oh my gosh, Shangri La!" You know. So I don't know. Do you guys ever canoe through those areas and hear from the Possible. I, I noticed on your range map that they were looks like in Wapaka. They're on the Lower Wolf, so yeah. Outagamie, yeah. Wapaka. Like they're already Chippewa on that, so I would assume that you know, we have some really great flood plain forests here in the It would actually be kind of a cool, geeky distributional thing because the ecological tension zone in Wisconsin, you know, et cetera, cuts right down through this, through Portage County and and down into Wapaka, Washera, and, and it would be really interesting to know if they're. If they're yeah, I would just yeah. In Sam Robinson's book, Bird of Wisconsin, historically, I've learned that there's also, like, if you're scared yourself about going to this area by yourself, there are more canoers than you've ever thought imaginable or kayakers out there. So you can always recruit a local canoer or kayaker to do a little reconnaissance for you. And this is one of those projects that really, even for a beginning birder or a non-birder, who, who wouldn't want to see this unbelievably cool warbler coming in and out of the box? In fact, we ran into some fishermen on the Sugar River um, one day, and, and they said, oh, we wondered who were putting those boxes up. And I, of course, said, oh, I wondered who was dumb enough to go fishing on this river to <laughs> <laughs> get to this spot. But yeah, they were really interested. So. And you see lots of other cool stuff. Yeah. You may have covered this before I came in. Um, you know, I think as, as naturalists and, and people who like the outdoors, we like to be reinforced in, uh, in the gratification for having our efforts uh, succeed. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm curious, do we have good ecological baseline data on, on what's happening in the natural uh, cavities? My sense is that you know, we, you know, we it don't. Seems, seems to me we need, to, we need the only to know that, whether or not we're pulling successful nesters out of a regular natural cavity mm -hmm. and just uh, supplementing that or whether they have to have so many dummy nests. Uh, uh, you, you know what I'm going at? How can we get better ecological baseline data? Well, uh, the only study on prothonotaries that has a decent number of, there's two, a decent number of nests were from Dave Glasspolar, who at the time was working for the DNR, he's now up at um, uh, Michigan Tech. And he had much lower nest success and productivity rates than we do. So, you know, if you compare those sort of apples to oranges, 
Um, the boxes are probably much more productive. I mean, just because they don't allow cowbirds in is a huge, is a huge uh, step in the right direction. They're really, um, what, what you're arguing for, what I'd love to see is some young grad student take it on as a master's program. Because if, if you ever suffered through a grad school yourself, especially with birds, like nest, the sort of demographic data that you're arguing for is incredibly difficult and expensive to collect. But with a bird that nests in a box, it becomes really cheap and really easy. Um, and so Jeff and others, in Illinois and Tennessee and Tennessee and others have done years and years and years and years and years of that stuff. And, and Jeff does a lot of stuff with boxes, but he does them in a way where he can actually show that the boxes in the natural hole cavities are equivalent. He puts the boxes on the trees and not in these steel poles out in the water. And so, I mean, I think if you'd ask those experts, they'd tell you, oh, Andy, you're probably bumping up the population there because your boxes are going to be more successful than the natural nests. And there's a couple of folks, and I think it was in Tennessee, where they actually experimentally increased their prothonotary population in their study area by eight times using supplemental boxes. And then when they pulled the boxes, it went right back down to that equilibrium. So, you know, there, you know, from a grand conservation scheme, where I tell people is what I'm most interested in is, will a bunch of people such as yourselves um, in the Portage County area, <laughs> well, a bunch of people, you know, sort of get sucked in to this habitat through this golden swamp warbler. And then does it translate into concern and interest in the habitat and its protection and conservation? Yeah. I'm not calling on Kent to make this. <laughs> um, I do a bunch of kayaking on the lower you ever see one of those and it is occupied, do you really want people to let you know? Sure. And the boxes on the lower wolf, I'm trying to think if they'll be in a place that you'll see them. We, I gave a talk at the Northeast Audubon Club and it was really interesting. We had a couple of members there with big acreages on the lower wolf in these hunt, hunt clubs. And they put out a number of boxes last year and, I, and it was cool because they actually invited me out there and then I moved all their boxes to slightly better places. But um, but yeah, I put most of them that I put up have a sticker on them with my contact info. Do so they have, are they numbered? They should be. <laughs> well, you ever go out and check them and you find my cell phone in the bottom of the river? <laughs> it's amazing what you find in the bottom of the river. I didn't, I didn't throw this picture in there, but last year when the water was really low, like a hundred meters from the landing that we've been going down for three years, there's a submerged, like 1970s era era runabout boat in the in the Sugar River, and we were like, "What's going on here?" You know, it's got the the um, window thingy. Sorry, I'm really <laughs> and and uh, you know, it, we started singing the Gilligan's Island theme song. And, and then when we went out there this fall during the Christmas count, the water had come up with all the rain we had in December, November, and the boat was submerged again. So we're using that now as our river gauge, as whether or not we can see the boat. So you never know what you're going to find there. But absolutely tell me, and I can probably put you in touch with who's putting the boxes out. So on the lower wolf, it was some of those bird club members. And the fox, um, the, the Oshkosh Bird Club put some out. And they haven't gotten much luck on the white and the fox river yet. So. I did stop at White River Marsh last year on County Road B, and I heard a couple of prothonotaries, so i got to get Tom Schultz or someone interested in putting a box or two up there. But Do you put any, I, I see in your map that there are prothonotary warblers along the Mississippi River. What about There's the schools. bottoms, yeah. uh, river bottoms, Bagley bottoms in the, along in there, is that too? I just haven't had any volunteers get excited about that area yet. Seems like that would really. Yeah, there's right. the concern I have about the Mississippi, uh, not not for people putting boxes out, but just as a conservation angle. Is if I'm a I'm a river rat, born and bred. I, I grew up in Rochester, Minnesota, and grew up duck hunting in the Mississippi. If you go out and explore the Mississippi, you'll see the hydrology of the Mississippi River has been horribly altered in the last 
whatever since they built the locks and dams. And there isn't very good forest regeneration <coughs> there. And so if you go out into the, it's, the woods looks okay now. There's no young trees. And when a tree falls over, it's just reed canary grass. I mean, just solid reed canary grass. And the biologists over there are, you know, concerned about that too and playing around with it. But I do wonder in that system if prothonotaries and great crested flycatchers and nuthatches and all these guys that nest in cavities, if they are probably limited or will be more limited by that sort of hydrological problem. But I do have one volunteer who's going to. Unfortunately, he had, couldn't do it this year, but he's going to play around a little bit on pool time. Um, that brings up a good point. You know, on the public lands, you know, I usually work with the local manager to get permission to do it. And not only that, but they're, they'll get interested and they want to put these out there, put boxes up, because they'll get calls from the public and that sort of stuff. But, yeah. Have you experimented at all, at all or has anybody tried any different colors and noticed any? Um, other than Mike putting some little little plastic decoys on top of the boxes, we haven't experimented much. Um, only because they they seem to just get used. I mean, literally, for the last two years, of the 70 boxes, only one box per year didn't have something stuffing it full of nest material. So it's pretty incredible. And I was just kidding, Kent. You can actually ask questions. <laughs> I missed. Uh, I missed that. What did you say? <laughs> you can't ask me a question. About that. Okay. Uh, I was going to ask: Are there any other warblers known to make dummy nests? I sort of just associate that with cavity nesters. Cavity nesters. So maybe Lucy's warbler. It could be. Maybe mm -hmm. the Lucy's warbler expert. You can't look it up on Wikipedia today. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So. What if your country friends are all uh, kayakers and they like to go on the Pogo River? Mm -hmm. What if they decide to get in boxes from you? What do they do? Do they have to ask permission for putting up boxes? I mean, the Pogo River between Irish and Park and Winkle, probably what do call it? Jordan Park, it seems to me that would be prime territory. Yeah, I mean, who, I don't know who the property, I don't know your, your hangouts here, but who are the property owners and... We would have to get the permission. I think it's always a good courtesy, especially yeah. when you have a box out there, people want to know what's going on. And, but, you know, think of it too as a potential outreach tool. If you've got some good parks where you can actually get a box in a good habitat that people can walk near to, uh -huh. and you can take kids to watch a warbler put nest material in, it's... That's a real uh, dynamite outreach tool. I specifically put one right, if you know Avon Bottoms, Nelson Road cuts right right through the Avon Bottoms. I put one right off of Nelson Road so that you could park your car with your coffee and just watch the warblers right from, from the car. And that worked really well. Although this year, tree swallows used it for some reason. But the two years previous, it fledged chicks. So, there's, there's some great places like that if you can sort of combine the boxes with some outreach opportunities. I'm trying to find someone who lives in Fort Atkinson because there's this awesome park right outside of Fort Atkinson. Do you know which one I'm I talking about? I grew up about? there, yes. Where the Park River comes in. And I drove down the road this year and there was a prothonotary digging a nest cavity like a chickadee does out of this big stump like 15 feet from my car. And I was like, oh, just stick a box in there. It'd be awesome. And now, by the way, my colleagues who are just starting this boreal birds project and these conifer bogs up north, they're already sick of me calling them because I really want to find somebody who will stick 10 or 15 boxes into some of these bogs to get boreal chickens. Yes, boxes. Wouldn't that be awesome? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I actually found out that Matt Ederson from, from uh, Duluth beat me to it. He's already got boreal chickens in boxes up north. Mm -hmm. We can be second. You'll stick around for a little bit. I'll stick around. Let me get a couple people to ask you for those five boxes.
That's why we celebrate this blessed February day. Abraham, Abraham. She's not here tonight. You wait here. I'll go up and see if Jim's seen her. Just some way to take her to the day. Remember now, day after tomorrow. Day Valentine's Day. Mm -hmm.